Hello, folks. Today on Winners, I'm going to tell you an amazing story about young Joe Nemechek. It's not his life story. Heck, he's still in his 20s. It's a great tale just the same. You'll meet the important characters in his life, his mom and dad, his brothers and sister, and his new wife, Andrea, the family who helped him turn near tragedy into triumph. And now, let me show you the beginning of my story. Running in the top five on lap 75, all hell broke loose after Joe and Jimmy Spencer tangled. Chuck Baum, with nowhere to go, hit Joe amongst a lot of other people at close to 200 miles an hour. And as you see, things just heated up from there. Gee, that's the beginning? Wow, well, it looked more like the end for a while. And you won't believe how Joe repaid those guys who helped him escape from that inferno. I'm Neil Bonnet, your man in Hueytown, and this is Winners. And we'll have the Joe Nemechek story coming right up. Winners is brought to you by Fram Filter Products. Fram, you can pay a little now or a lot later. And Autolite Spark Plugs and Wire and Cable Products. Autolite Spark Plugs, guaranteed for two years no matter how far you go. It had to be a nightmare for Joe Nemechek. That start of the 1992 season. He expected to win, and he loved to win. He was Bush Grand National Rookie of the Year in 1990, and he could take it all in 92. But that first race at Daytona, something went wrong, terribly wrong. But then he got help from two very unlikely saviors car went down the racetrack and I was like oh no I was praying to God please don't hit me in the door and I went back up the racetrack and hit the wall and I, I was looking out the out the window and I was looking at Chuck Bowne right in his eyes I mean I just was focused on him he didn't have anywhere to go and he hit me in the driver's door and it wasn't a, a real hard hit it, it hit pretty good but the car spun around and when it started going backwards the fuel came up into the car when the car came to a stop I was ready to get out, and I went to get out, and I forgot I had the sternum strap on. And it caught me around the neck, and then I started panicking. I'd been holding my breath for 30 seconds, and, and with all the adrenaline and everything going, I, I had to take a breath. And when I did, it wasn't the thing to do. It was the awfulest thing that I ever breathed. Joe was struggling to get free of a terrifying situation that very well could have meant lights out. Then he got some critical help from two guys who had been involved in the same wreck. When we started spinning and sliding, I didn't really know what was going on. I just was trying to pay attention to what I was doing. I looked up in the mirror when I was sliding down the bank and saw something engulfed in flames. I didn't know who it was, what it was, and I just knew somebody was in trouble. I burnt my eyes. The, the heat was so intense, I opened my eyes, and it just burnt the corneas on my eyes. Uh, so everything was blurry and I mean I was just panicking here I thought you know I'm gonna die in this car and, and about that time someone grabbed my arm and when they did my hand just happened to be on the latch and it popped the latch and out the car I came and it was Todd Bodine and Bobby Labine. I went in there the first time and I couldn't breathe because because the flames and the smoke I put my shield down on my visor on my helmet went in there and, and helped Todd help him get help you get Joe out of the car. You breathe in the smoke and you, you lose your oxygen, you lose your energy. And, you know, the, the main thing I thought about was just getting whoever it was out of the car. And, uh, you know, I run over there and, and Joe was, was pretty much spent. He had used all his energy he had trying to get out. So, you know, I'm just glad I could help him out. Joe's unique thing about that was the two guys that helped you out of the car were the same two guys you had to race for the championship right at the end of the season. Thanks to them, you know, they stopped and, and uh, uh, sure, they could have kept on going. You know, they were involved in the same crash, but they saw that I was in trouble and they stopped. And uh, I think if I was in their situation, I would have done the same thing. And I was glad, you know, I'm glad now that, that they did do it. You know, it's pretty neat. We get down to the end of the year and, and we were the three battling for the points championship. And, uh, but, but it was a very uh, emotional time there. And, 
uh, not knowing if you can get out of the car when this thing's burning. Uh, fire is the worst thing that scares me, and I think it's uh, a, a, a racer's worst nightmare. A season that started out as a nightmare for Joe would turn into one of bad dreams for Daytona heroes Bobby Labonte and Todd Bodine as this threesome battled down the wire for the Bush Grand National Championship. After that nightmare, things really looked dark for Joe. But his family and Andrea all pulled together. As you'll see in a moment, the results were sensational. Joe Nemechek got where he is with the great help of his family. And it sure didn't hurt that the family business involved tools or machinery. The Nemechek family, Father Joe Sr., Mother Martha, Brother John and Mark, Sister Marty, and Joe's wife, Andrea, all work for Joe. But their contribution involves a lot more than keeping track of nuts and bolts. They back me in every, anything I've ever done, and, and anybody in our family, it's, Everything we've done has always been a family effort, and uh, whether it be my brother, my sister, or, or, or myself, just everybody, everybody's behind everybody in whatever they do, and uh, you can't ask for, for any more support from my mom and dad, and it's great to have a family that, that's able to do that. The Nemechek family got an unusual start in wrestling. Joe barred the car of a man who worked for his father in their Mulberry Florida machine two business. It was a time slalom event. Joe took on the car's owner, and just listen to what happened. You race against time, and you race around the cones. They have a track set up, and you can't knock the cones down. So we went out, and uh, he went out first and came back in. Then I got in the car first time out, and I went faster than he did. So we kept going back and forth all day, and finally he blew the motor up. <laughs> so uh, I was glad in that part, but that was my first experience, and it, it was really neat uh, getting out it was all different kinds of cars. I mean, you could take your stock street car, or they had uh, like small indie cars there, all kinds of stuff. So it was a real neat experience, and once I did that, I was ready to go racing. But even before that experience, the 13-year-old had hopped on a motorcycle and got his first taste of speed. Originally, when I first started, I saw him on TV, and, and it was looked really neat, so I wanted to try it. And uh, I got my first bike, and we got a Honda XR75. I'll never forget. We still have that bike. And still in one piece? Still in one piece. Uh, uh, that's a collector's item now. It, it definitely had some miles put on it, but learned a lot on that. And uh, I was pushing it past its capacity. It was, it was for, like, trail riding and stuff, and here I was running off big jumps and... Uh, so we moved up, we got into some Yamaha YZ80 racing bikes, and as soon as we did that, we, we started racing and started winter racing. He was hooked on racing, but not the sore knees and ankles that came with riding bikes. Joe put together a ride with sides and began taking it one day at a time. I went to a junkyard, bought my first car for $100. It was old junk Pinto, took it back to the shop, put a roll cage in it, rebuilt the motor, and went racing. And that was right at the end of 1986, right in the last couple months of 86. And when we really first started racing was 1987. And same car, we changed the tires on it for the next season. We went out and we won, I, I think, 13 races straight right from the start. The next step for Joe was the United Stock Car Alliance Series. When we moved into there, my first race was, was at Bithlow, Bithlow, Florida, or, or Orlando Speed World. And first time I'd ever been in a late model stock car. And these were full-blown uh, V8s, 2,800 pound cars, a uh, lot of horsepower and small amount of tires on them. But we went out, we qualified sixth and finished second in my first race. My second race we won. And that year we, we either won five or six races and won the championship and was also rookie of the year in that series. We ran year to year, and, and we accomplished something in 1988, and then we were looking at 1989, and we decided to jump into off-pro. We did. We were very, very competitive the whole season in off-pro, and we won four races, had a couple pole positions, and we ended up winning the championship and uh, the rookie of the year titles. And, and that was, that, at that time, that was the toughest challenge I had ever had because there was a lot of really good drivers. By the end of 1989, 
With Joe determined to try his hand at Bush Grand National Racing, the family formed a team to go big time racing. Each member got an assignment, pits, shop work, logging laps, and the leader was Joe Sr. My father and I, were very close. Um, and it, it's good because he, uh, he understands, you know, he started out in a business uh, with nothing and, and he developed a business uh, such as Master Machine and Tool and a couple other businesses uh, from the ground up. But it just shows that he's determined and, and a lot of that has rubbed off on me. And we can sit down and he can help me make some decisions and he gives me his input and uh, it's, it's, there's nothing like having experience help you out. I think our family's always been uh, real supportive of, of the children in all sports, and, and it was just another step. While Joe credits his father's advice with helping him run well enough in his freshman season to earn Grand National Rookie of the Year honors, it was to his mother he turned when the going got tough, and she who recorded the good times. And I enjoy taking pictures of each one of my children, not just Joe, but each one. Whatever they're in is where my husband and I are, and, and we just love it, you know. And I think as they get older, they're going to look back and they're going to see these albums and, and the movies and the cassettes and everything, and they're going to be happy that we've done it for them. Hopefully one day I can repay them, but uh, right now they, they, uh, they're involved in this sport as much as I am, and... and they get the thrills out of winning also and there's nothing like the thrill of victory uh, uh, they were probably more excited than i was when we won the championship that's how much emotionally they're involved in this his family performed a variety of race week and race day duties Vic kangas was hired and installed as crew chief joe then put the final piece of the puzzle together by drafting longtime alabama gang member donnie allison to coordinate his chassis setup for me i'm just watching folks the first year of uh, we, we made some pretty good business decisions when we first started because I hired Donnie Allison and that was one of the best things I ever, I ever did because we were jumping into a whole new series, very competitive and I knew, I knew it was competitive, but we had to have someone that, that kind of knew the ropes and could give me a basic setup in these cars because they were, the cars were totally different than anything I had before and uh, Donnie could give that to me. We really didn't know anything about the uh, what I would call the big league, moving into the big leagues. And, and Donnie was a real asset because he knew so much about the, the setups on the cars and he knew all the people. And I think that we, uh, uh, it gave us an advantage because we were kind of accepted into the, uh, into the racing, the racing family. Let me tell you something about Neiman Check. He, He's a no-quit kind of guy. You saw when he won the championship this year. Went right down to the wire the year before to, and, and the rookie deal went the same way. And, you know, the kids got the talent to drive a race car, and he's got a lot of will. He knew all the people involved in the sport, so I, I kind of had a way that, to get into the sport and get to know everybody uh, without having to, to learn it all myself, you know, starting out. When a season starts off like Joe's did at Daytona, it takes a huge effort to shrug it off and get on with the business at hand. By midsummer, Joe was still looking for a win. He knew what it would take, and when the Bush Grand National Series reached Indianapolis, he was sure there was a victory in the cards. By August, Joe was ready to move on up. We had a lot of good runs. We have a lot of second place finishes. So I knew our team was capable of winning a race. And, and you just have to run consistent and you have to run in the front of the pack all the time. The more you can run there, the better your chances are of winning a race. You know, I think Earnhardt really came to bat for you a couple of times, helped on some situations. Oh, yes. Uh, Dale Earnhardt is, is one of the biggest people that have, that have helped my career. I mean, he's, he's gave me a lot of support. He's told me where I'm doing things wrong, and uh, he gets after me when I do something wrong, and, and uh, uh, he, he's always after me to do better. And for a long time, he's after me to win races, so finally we won a race, and, and uh, now he's off me about that. Having learned from a master, Joe paid his mentor back by beating him in his own game, bumping and banging all the way to the finish line. What about beating Earnhardt in New Hampshire, though? Now, that had to be a thrill. That was, a, that was a very big day and probably one of the biggest days in my career. 
get being able to be out on a racetrack with Dale Earnhardt and battle him, and uh, he wanted that win as much as I did, and, and we just beat him across the start finish line. By then, with Joe leading and winning races, he and his Chevrolet Lumina were getting plenty of air time. But it was his mother's enthusiasm and propensity taking hundreds of pictures of her successful son that charmed television producers as well as all the fans. People come up and say, Mrs. Nemechek, can I get a picture of you? You know, because you're a star in yourself. And I said, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> and, uh, and they'll take pictures and, and they'll want autographs. And poor Joe, he's signing autographs. And I want your mom's <laughs> autograph. And here I go, sign an autograph for him. But it, it's beautiful. But I would rather them to keep the camera on the guys because our team is really special. And they just give of their self so much. And, and they, they're the ones that need all that. She's making up scrapbooks. Uh, just about everything in my racing career has been documented in photos, newspaper articles. So she's busy just keeping up that aspect because that's very important. Uh, you know, we can go back to 1986 or 1987, and I can show you pictures of everything I've done. So it's very important having all that, that finished. All right, Joe, you've been the whole season. It winds down to Hickory, North Carolina, a little bitty half-mile racetrack. You got to finish six or better. How can you handle that pressure? It was a very, very trying day. Uh, that day started out. We had a good quali qualifying spot. We were starting up at the front, and you know Bobby Labonte was was not far ahead of me, and and we felt we had a very good car, and we were off just a little bit on the setup. The car was loose, and we could never seem to get that caution we needed, and uh, we just had to keep working all day. I don't think he even thought of the pressure at the time. He just he just wanted to finish in the top six, and. When he found out that he was in sixth position, he was happy, you know, I mean, it wasn't easy getting to that sixth spot to get, to get those extra three points, but, you know, he did what he had to do, and I'm really proud of him for that. I would have to say when that race started, I was probably uh, more focused in that particular race on what I had to do than any other race I've ever run. Uh, I wanted the championship very badly, and I never gave up. I always knew that I had to, uh, that race we had to finish six or better. And Joe never thought he'd be battling for the championship with the two guys who saved his life. It's kind of funny because those are the two guys that came down to the end of the year we were battling for the points championship. And uh, it just goes to show uh, you have to be consistent. Uh, you know, I had bad luck in that one race, but somewhere along the line, the other guys had some bad luck somewhere else and it evens out. When Joe gets focused on something, when it's either a, a, a pole, getting a pole position, or a, a winning the race, or winning the championship, when he gets focused on, on a certain goal, a certain task, uh, it, it's, all, it's tough to stop him. It's tough to, to get him riled up. He's very uh, cool, calm, and collected under uh, pressure situations. And he did an excellent job because he didn't lose as many points as I was hoping he would because he, he was able to maintain good finishes towards the end of the year. Pressure didn't seem to get to him at all. You know, anybody that can go through what he did at Hickory and come out winning a championship, he deserves it in my book. To put it literally, you survived Hickory and finished right where you had to and you won the championship. What did it feel like when you turned that switch off and crawled out of there? It was a big relief as far as a lot of the pressure was, was off. And it took me a while after the race because I, I was still, uh, I was still psyched up. I was still ready to race. You know, the old adrenaline gets pumping, and, and uh, it was hard to to just sit down and relax and say, "Hey, you know, we really won the championship." Yep, folks, you saw that right. Bobby Labonte and Todd Bodine, the drivers who helped save his life, were the very ones Joe beat up on to win the Bush Grand National title. Coming up, young Joe triumphs when no one else could. We started this story with Joe's awful wreck at Daytona. And by now, you know how he made a terrific comeback to become the 1992 Bush Grand National Champion. But neither Joe nor his family were prepared for an additional honor, being named most popular driver as voted for by the fans. 
I was very happy for Joe that he received the award and, and uh, because I think that that award is probably one of the most prestigious awards you can win in the racing circle and and uh, it just it just uh, uh, give you a feeling that you couldn't I can't express. Let's talk about a winner. Today young Joe Nemechek is a successful owner and a winning driver. He holds both the Bush Grand National and most popular driver titles. He has truly snatched victory from the jaws of disaster and defeat. An awful lot has happened in his life already. Think just how much is left to come. I tell you what, I hope you enjoyed this one. But please come back next week for a review of the Hueytown Light Opera Company's production of the Phantom of Talladega. Did I say that? Hey, <laughs> I'm Neil Bonnet. Or maybe should I say my name is Darrell Walter. He's trying to steal the show, you know. We'll see you next week. Winners has been brought to you by Fram Filter Products. Fram, you can pay a little now or a lot later. And Autolite Spark Plugs and Wire and Cable Products. Autolite Spark Plugs, guaranteed for two years no matter how far you go. When you join us next time on Winners, meet Australian driver Jeff Brattle, who's still going strong after 20 years of victories and has no intention of stopping now.